She said, I am now old enough to say and do whatever I want to do, so shut up. Welcome back to our channel. Today, let's explore more about the life of Diane Warwick. With a voice that's both enchanting and soothing, Warwick has secured her place as a pivotal figure in American pop music and culture, earning herself the status of a legend with five Grammy Awards. However, as Warwick steps into her ninth decade, her life presents challenges that are anything but serene. Now at 80, she faces significant hurdles, from financial instability to legal disputes over taxes, illustrating that her journey is fraught with obstacles. In this exploration, we'll uncover the real-life saga of this musical icon, contrasting her public triumphs with the private battles she endures. What has transpired in Dionne Warwick life? Everything is revealed in this video. Let's follow along. At the age of 80, Dionne Warwick faced numerous challenges following a severe financial crisis. On March 21, 2013, she filed for Chapter 7 bankruptcy in New Jersey, marking a significant and unfortunate shift in her financial circumstances. The bankruptcy was precipitated by reported mismanagement of her business affairs, which left her in dire financial straits. The documents filed during the bankruptcy proceedings revealed Warwick had accumulated substantial liabilities over the years. Among these, the most notable were nearly $7 million in unpaid federal taxes for the period from 1991 to 1999. Additionally, Warwick faced over $3 million in unpaid business taxes to the state of California. Despite these financial hurdles, Warwick and her attorney made efforts to negotiate with tax officials to find a mutually agreeable resolution for her outstanding tax debts. However, it soon became clear that reaching an amicable agreement was not feasible. Confronted with overwhelming financial burdens and unable to settle with tax authorities, Warwick and her legal counsel concluded that declaring Chapter 7 bankruptcy was the most practical solution. Chapter 7 Bankruptcy involves the liquidation of a debtor's assets to repay creditors, and for Warwick, this decision was likely viewed as a last resort to manage the escalating tax debts and financial problems that had built up over several years. Diane Warwick's financial decline can be attributed in part to lawsuits from her ex-husband, William Elliott, alongside significant tax issues that began in 1966. Warwick and Elliott, an actor and drummer, initially married in 1966 but divorced shortly thereafter in May 1967. They reconciled quickly, remarried in Milan, Italy in August 1967, and welcomed their first son, David Elliott, on January 18, 1969 in East Orange, New Jersey. Their second son, Damon Elliott, was born on May 30, 1975. The couple eventually separated for good, leading to a final divorce in December 1975 in Los Angeles. During the divorce proceedings, Elliot sought financial support, requesting $2,000 a month, a claim that was denied pending a community property trial. He also requested an additional $5,000, citing his meager monthly earnings of $500 compared to Warwick's income. Warwick, who had become the primary breadwinner, expressed the challenges of her role noting the difficulties posed by traditional gender expectations about financial provision. She emphasized her lifelong financial independence, a trait instilled by her father, the only man who had ever supported her financially. In 2002, Warwick faced legal challenges when she was arrested at Miami International Airport for possession of marijuana. Authorities discovered 11 suspected marijuana cigarettes hidden in a lipstick container in her carry-on luggage. She was charged with possession of less than five grams of marijuana. Later, in October 2007, Warwick's financial troubles continued as she appeared on the top 250 delinquent taxpayers list with a reported personal income tax delinquency ranging between 265,000 and 305,583. This tax lien, initially filed on July 24, 1997 was significantly adjusted in 2009 when the Internal Revenue Service acknowledged an accounting error and subsequently revoked 1.2 million of the claimant tax liability. 
the sequence of events highlights the complex interplay of personal and financial challenges in Warwick's life. Dionne Warwick, a distinguished figure in the world of music, was born in Yast Orange, New Jersey, to lay drinker and Mansell Warwick. Her upbringing was steeped in musical influences and cultural diversity, with her mother Lee managing the Drinkard Singers, a renowned gospel group, while her father Mansell juggled multiple professions including roles as a Pullman porter, chef, record promoter, and certified public accountant, CPA. Diane was named after her maternal aunt, adding a layer of familial significance to her identity. Warwick grew up alongside her sister, Delia, often called Dee Dee, and her brother Mansell Jr., who tragically lost his life in an accident in 1968 at just 21 years old. Her family's roots were a blend of African American, Native American, and Dutch heritages, reflecting a rich tapestry of cultural backgrounds that influenced her music and personal identity. Throughout her childhood in East Orange, Dionne Warwick engaged in numerous activities, indicative of an active and socially engaged upbringing. She was a Girl Scout, a role that marked her early involvement in community and leadership activities. Her musical talents were nurtured from a young age as she frequently sang gospel music at the New Hope Baptist Church in nearby Newark, New Jersey. This early exposure to music within a church setting laid the foundational skills and passion that would propel her into a lifelong musical career. After completing her high school education at East Orange High School in 1959, Warwick demonstrated her dedication to her craft by enrolling at the Hart College of Music in West Hartford, Connecticut. There, she immersed herself in formal music education, honing her skills and preparing for a career in music. Warwick's transition from a music student to a professional singer was marked by her participation in backing vocal sessions in New York City. Alongside other talented vocalists, she lent her voice to various recording sessions, a common practice that provided her with invaluable industry experience. It was during one of these sessions that she met Bert Bacharach, a renowned composer. This meeting proved to be pivotal, as Bacharach was instrumental in shaping her early career, recognizing her unique vocal abilities and helping launch her into the spotlight. This encounter set the stage for a fruitful collaboration that would define a significant portion of Warwick's musical legacy. During a 1962 background vocal session for The Drifter's Mexican Divorce, Diane Warwick's distinctive voice caught the attention of the esteemed composer Bert Bacharach, a pivotal figure in the brill-building songwriting scene known for his work with lyricist Hal David. Bacharach was immediately struck by Warwick's vocal mastery, capable of delivering both robust and subtle nuances with ease. He famously described her voice in a 1967 Time magazine article as being able to express a complex emotional depth as intricate and captivating as miniature ships in bottles. Sensing her potential, Bacharach proposed that Warwick record demo versions of his compositions with David. This partnership required Warwick to create demo tracks to showcase to record labels, demonstrating the commercial viability of their songs. For her efforts, Warwick was compensated $12.50 per session, roughly equivalent to $120 today, a modest sum that belied the significant impact these sessions would have on her career trajectory. These demo recordings proved crucial. They not only highlighted Warwick's exceptional vocal talents, but also led directly to her securing a record deal, a defining moment that thrust her into the limelight and cemented her status in the music industry. Warwick herself reflected on this transformative period with gratitude, once stating, What Bacharach and David saw in me, no one else could see. They not only gave me songs, but a chance to be seen. Her collaboration with Bacharach and David flourished, resulting in a slew of hits that both enchanted audiences and dominated the charts. Their combined creativity allowed for the development of sophisticated musical arrangements that challenged and showcased Warwick's vocal and interpretative skills. This creative synergy culminated in the release of Warwick's debut album, presenting Dionne Warwick in early 1963, featuring tracks like It's Love That Really Counts and Make It Easy on Yourself, 
the partnership reached a significant milestone when Scepter Records released Warwick's debut solo single, Don't Make Me Over, in November 1962. The song was an immediate hit, marking her emergence as a powerful solo artist and setting the stage for a storied career intertwined with Bacharach and David, creating a legendary musical legacy that continues to resonate. Interestingly, the title Don't Make Me Over originated from Dionne Warwick herself during a moment of frustration. After discovering that her hope for debut single, Make It Easy On Yourself had been given to Jerry Butler, Warwick, exasperated, uttered the phrase Don't Make Me Over to producers Bert Bacharach and Hal David. This spontaneous outburst inspired them to craft the song, which became their first top 40 pop hit, peaking at number 21 and a top 5 US R&B hit. Notably, Warwick's last name was misspelled as Wari on the singles label, leading her to adopt the new spelling Warwick both professionally and personally. Following the success of Don't Make Me Over, Warwick embarked on a 1962 tour of France. Her manager's call to tour led to widespread acclaim, and she was dubbed Paris's Black Pearl. That year, Marlene Dietrich introduced Warwick on stage at the Paris Olympia, further cementing her status as a rising star. Subsequent singles like This Empty Place, with its B-side wishing and hoping, and Make the Music Play found moderate success on the top 100 charts. However, it was her fourth single, Anyone Who Had a Heart, released in November 1963, that marked a significant breakthrough. The song not only became her first top 10 pop hit, reaching number eight in the US, but also achieved international success as a million seller. This was followed by another major hit, Walk On By, released in April 1964, which became an international sensation and million seller, solidifying Warwick's career throughout the 1960s. During this time, much of Warwick's music was written and produced by Bacharach and David. She managed to navigate the British invasion better than many other American artists, achieving significant UK hits with songs like Walk On By and Do You Know The Way To San Jose. Despite the frustration of learning that her songs were often covered by British artists like Cilla Black, Sandy Shaw, and Dusty Springfield, Warwick maintained a robust presence in the music scene. She even met Cilla Black during a tour in Britain, where Black expressed her intention to release You're My World in the United States. Warwick's impact during the 1960s was profound. She was named the best-selling female vocalist by Cashbox magazine in 1964, a title she received again in 1969, 1970, and 1971. Other honors included being named the top female vocalist by Playboy's influential music poll in 1970 and being honored as Woman of the Year by Harvard's Hasty Pudding Society in 1969. In a May 1965 Time magazine cover article titled The Sound of the Sixties, Diane Warwick's singing style was celebrated as both pleasurable and complex captivating scholarly circles and chic audiences alike. Her unique sound juxtaposed sharply with the rising tide of rock and roll that dominated the era. An interesting side note in Warwick's career involved the James Bond film Thunderball. Initially, her song Mr. Kiss Kiss Bang Bang was slated to be the theme song. However, the film's producers later decided that the theme song should include the film's title which led to Tom Jones performing Thunderball. Despite this, the melody of Mr. Kiss Kiss Bang Bang was not discarded. It remained a significant part of the film's score and was later featured on the 30th anniversary CD release of Bond songs. The mid-1960s through the early 1970s marked a golden era for Warwick characterized by a series of gold-selling albums and numerous top 20 and top 10 hit singles. The story of the song Alfie is particularly notable. While Burt Bacharach originally intended for Warwick to perform the tune for the Michael Caine film of the same name, the producers insisted on a British artist, leading to Cilla Black recording the track. Though Black's version only peaked at number 95 in the US, it became a top 10 hit in the UK and Australia. Meanwhile, a cover version by Cher, 
used in American prints of the film, reached number 33 in the U.S. In September 1969, CBS Television aired Warwick's first television special, the Dion Warwick Chevy Special. The show featured guests like Burt Bacharach, comedian George Kirby, Glenn Campbell, and Creedence Clearwater Revival. Reflecting on her television experience, Warwick once remarked, Television was a fascinating venture for me, allowing a different facet of performance that brought new dimensions to my music. In 1970, Warwick took a significant step by forming her own label, Sunday Records, where she served as president. Sunday Records was distributed by Scepter. A notable, albeit peculiar, change came in 1971 when at the advice of her astrologer friend Linda Goodman, Warwick altered the spelling of her last name to Warwick, believing it would bring her greater success. However, after a series of disappointments and a notable absence from the Billboard Top 40, she reverted to the original spelling of her name. Reflecting on this period, Warwick shared, The industry is full of superstitions and mystical suggestions, but ultimately, it was my music that spoke loudest. This detailed narrative captures a dynamic and transformative period in Dionne Warwick's illustrious career, showcasing her adaptability and resilience in the face of industry shifts and personal endeavors. In the early 1970s, Dionne Warwick faced a pivotal moment in her illustrious career when she parted ways with the iconic songwriting duo Burt Bacharach and Hal David, who had been instrumental in her rise to fame. While she remained a sought-after live performer on the global stage, her recording success dwindled, producing few hits in the early to mid-1970s. However, a notable exception emerged in 1974, with the hit duet Then Came You, recorded alongside The Spinners and produced by Tom Bell. Initially skeptical about the track, Warwick's doubts were visible. She was unconvinced even as the recording session wrapped up. Tom Bell, on the other hand, believed in the song's potential so fervently that he made a playful bet with Warwick, each signing half of a torn dollar bill, promising that if the song failed to hit number one, he would send her his signed half. To Warwick's delight and apology, the song soared to the top of the Billboard Hot 100, and she joyfully sent Bell's half back. Despite the triumph of Then Came You, Warwick's five-year stint with Warner Brothers Records saw limited commercial success, leading her to leave the label in 1977. A new chapter in Warwick's career began in 1979, when she signed with Arista Records, heralding a resurgence that brought a slew of hits and revitalized her status in the music world. Her first major success with Arista came with the release of I'll Never Love This Way Again, produced by Barry Manilow which quickly became a million-selling single. In 1980, Warwick expanded her influence into television, hosting the two-hour TV special Solid Gold 79, which subsequently evolved into the beloved weekly show Solid Gold. During her tenure as host in 1980 and 1981, and again in 1985 and 1986, Warwick dazzled audiences with her performances, often duetting with her co-hosts in arrangements crafted by the show's musical director, Michael Miller. Warwick's collaborations continued to bear fruit in 1982, when she teamed up with Johnny Mathis on Friends in Love, which enjoyed a spot in the top 40. Later that year, she achieved significant acclaim with the album Heartbreaker, a collaboration with Barry Gibb of the Bee Gees. The title track became a massive international hit, climbing into the top 10 of Billboard's Hot 100 and securing the number one position on the adult contemporary chart. The album's global sales surpassed 3 million copies, earning Warwick a gold record in the US and platinum certification in Britain. This string of successes underscored Warwick's enduring appeal and solidified her legacy as an iconic artist in the music industry. In 1985, Dionne Warwick added her legendary voice to the philanthropic anthem, We Are the World, joining an ensemble of musical icons including Michael Jackson, Diana Ross, and Ray Charles. This powerful song not only dominated the Billboard Hot 100 for four consecutive weeks, but also achieved quadruple platinum status in the United States, 
symbolizing a universal message of unity and compassion. That year also rekindled her professional relationship with Bert Bacharach after a hiatus since their prolific collaborations in the 1970s. Together, they produced That's What Friends Are For, a charity single for the American Foundation for AIDS Research, MFAR, featuring luminaries such as Gladys Knight, Elton John, and Stevie Wonder. This track soared to the top of the charts, maintaining the number one spot for four weeks and raising over $3 million for AIDS research. It won Grammy Awards for Best Pop Performance by a Duo or Group with Vocals and Song of the Year, the latter honoring its writers Bacharach and Carol Byer Sager, and was declared the most popular song of 1986 by Billboard magazine. During this vibrant decade, Warwick's album Friends reached number 12 on the Billboard album chart, marking it as her most successful album of the 1980s. In 1987, she received a special recognition award at the American Music Awards for That's What Friends Are For. Additionally, her duet with Jeffrey Osborne, Love Power, enjoyed considerable chart success, topping the adult contemporary chart, reaching number five in R&B and climbing to number 12 on the Billboard Hot 100. Decades later, Dionne Warwick continues to be a powerful presence in the entertainment industry. In 2020, she captivated audiences on season three of The Masked Singer as the character Mouse. Although eliminated in the fifth round, Warwick returned for the season finale, delivering an emotive performance of what the world needs, now is love, with finalists Night Angel, Frog, and Turtle, in a tribute to healthcare workers battling the COVID-19 pandemic. Moreover, during a Verzu's battle featuring Gladys Knight and Patti LaBelle, Warwick made a memorable guest appearance, closing the show with a rendition of That's What Friends Are For, a poignant reminder of the enduring power of friendship and collaboration in music and life. Dionne Warwick's personal life intertwined with her remarkable career, has seen its fair share of notable highs and poignant lows. Her romantic journey notably centers around her relationship with William Elliott, an actor and musician whom she married twice. Their initial union in 1966 was short-lived, leading to a divorce within a year. Yet, their connection remained strong, prompting a reconciliation and a second marriage in 1967 which lasted until 1975. This on-and-off relationship with Elliot was a significant, albeit tumultuous, part of her life narrative. Warwick is also a devoted mother to two sons, David and Damon Elliot, who have both forged their paths in the entertainment industry. David Elliot has demonstrated his versatility by engaging in various aspects of the industry. From co-writing Love Will Find a Way with Warwick and Whitney Houston, to acting, notably portraying singer Sam Cooke in the film Ali. He has also been a part of his mother's touring band, playing drums and performing duets. His brother, Damon Elliott, has made a name for himself as a successful music producer, working with renowned artists such as Pink, Christina Aguilera, and Keisha Cole, and producing Warwick's 2006 album, My Friends and Me. Beyond her familial ties, Warwick developed a deep connection with Brazil after her first visit in the early 1960s. Enchanted by its vibrant culture and warm people, she learned Portuguese and lived intermittently between Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo for several years. She considered Brazil her second home until 2005, when family obligations necessitated her return to the United States to care for her ailing mother and sister. Despite facing personal challenges, including a health scare in 2015 that led to a hospitalization and ankle surgery following a fall, Warwick's resilience and love for life have remained undiminished. She has spoken fondly of her desire to retire in Brazil, reflecting her lasting affection for the country. Through the various phases of her life, Warwick's enduring spirit, commitment to family, and deep-rooted connections to places that have touched her heart. Paint a picture of a woman who cherishes her roles as a mother, a daughter, and a global citizen, as much as her identity as a legendary artist. Dionne Warwick, 
a name synonymous with vocal excellence and resilience, has not only contributed to the music industry, but has also left an indelible mark on the cultural landscape. In her autobiography, In My Life As I See It, Warwick shares her journey, including the recognition she received from various academic institutions. Her honorary doctorates include those from Hart College, Bethune-Cookman University, Shaw University, Columbia College of Chicago, Lincoln College, Illinois, where she was awarded a Doctor of Arts Honoris Causa in May 2010, and the University of Maryland Eastern Shore, which she received on February 10, 2021. Warwick's impact on music and popular culture was further acknowledged when she was nominated for the first time for inclusion in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame on February 10, 2021. This nomination celebrated her enduring influence and substantial contributions to the music world. Additionally, on December 3, 2021, her impressive career and impact were commemorated with a star on the Palm Springs Walk of Stars. Further immortalizing her legacy, the documentary film Diane Warwick, Don't Make Me Over delves into her life and illustrious career. Premiering at the Toronto International Film Festival in September 2021, the film showcases Warwick as not only a music icon, but a dynamic force in the entertainment industry. The documentary made its national television debut on CNN on January 1, 2023, providing a wider audience with an intimate look at her remarkable journey. Beyond her musical achievements, Warwick's collaborations have left a lasting legacy. Her chart-topping hit Superwoman, among others, showcases her ability to connect and resonate across genres and generations. Diane Warwick's story is not just one of musical success but of overcoming challenges, particularly highlighted by the trials she faced in her later years, including her financial and legal battles. Dionne Warwick's contributions to music are timeless, and her resilience and ability to adapt to the changing landscapes of the music industry are what make her a true icon. What do you think about Dionne Warwick's life of ups and downs and the challenges she faced, especially as she entered her 80s? Let's write your comments below, and let's keep the conversation going. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on stories that inspire and entertain. Thank you for watching. See you soon in our next video. Goodbye.